Hey, good morning, everyone. So in the, um, in the spirit of trying to uh, understand mechanisms and, and using, using a hierarchy of models, I'll be presenting today a um, process study that we did trying to understand the role of the connection between the tropics and the extratropics uh, to possibly generate low frequency variability in the um, equatorial Pacific. And this is a work that I've been doing in collaboration with Franco Moltenio and Fred Kucharski. So we've been uh, listening a lot already about the uh, PDO and what the PDO might be. So this is a little bit of a summary that the PDO might be um, um, a connection of, of many different things, for example, stochastically driven. It could be a passive ocean response to atmospheric fluxes. But it could also be perhaps a coupled mode of interaction between the ocean and atmos atmosphere, as somebody has uh, postulated before. Um, about what the PDO is made of, it could be uh, associated with both tropical forcing, and we'll be listening to that, through an atmospheric bridge of low frequency answer signal, but also local exotropical air sea interactions. And we've been listening to this talk already about the uh, PDO, which is probably not a physical mode, but it's just a statistical mode made of different physical processes. So I've been uh, looking at one of these uh, possible physical processes and what is the role in generating um, answer decadal variability, so the role of tropical, exotropical uh, interaction. So answer decadal variability, there's a few hypotheses out there, and some of them are, for example, the connections in this case now would be um, atmospheric teleconnections from an atmospheric bridge, but the other around from the exotropics to the tropics. Um, it could be just tropical noise and, and mean state changes generating this low frequency answer modulation. But it could also be a teleconnection from other basins, so for example, the Atlantic generating low frequency variability in the Pacific. And if we uh, manage to understand some of the processes that might give rise to this low frequency variability in, in the tropical Pacific, then perhaps we can also put forward yet another uh, explanation for the uh, warming hiatus. So this is the uh, observed PDO, which at the KDOM timescales, as I said, is probably uh, a, third, a third of it is remotely driven from the tropics. And that's the uh, time series of the uh, observed uh, PDO from Tremberth et al. So we know also that there is a, a very strong correlation between uh, PDO phases, for example, positive and negative phases, and, uh, and so low frequency variability. So basically when you have a uh, warm mode in the PDO, you have mostly a Ninos and the uh, opposite. So the connection between the PDO and the global mean sea surface temperature in trying to understand uh, the possible reasons for the warming hiatus, uh, this uh, figure has been shown, uh, a similar figure has been shown already in, in a few papers. So basically at the top I'm showing here the uh, global mean sea surface uh, temperature up to uh, a month ago and the uh, PDO index from observations. And so you see the uh, recent rebound in the PDO and the uh, accelerated signal uh, already seen in the uh, global mean sea surface temperature. And again, you can go back to your previous hiatus periods and see, and see that when you have a negative PDO, you have uh, hiatus periods and the opposite on, on a PDO in a warm phase. So explanation for the uh, recent warming hiatus, there's been uh, a few already. And for example, um, the one from Kosaka and Shia in 2013, which says that equatorial Pacific, equatorial Pacific uh, cooling has probably um, the most uh, influence on this warming hiatus. And England et al. has shown that if you account for the uh, trends in the uh, uh, trade winds in models, then you can reproduce the warming hiatus in model. And this is a schematic that we've seen, uh, that we've seen before. So all of these studies are pointing to a major role for the local Pacific in explaining the warming hiatus. But there's also, as I said, teleconnections from the Atlantic, which can cause low frequency variability in the Pacific. And this is the uh, sea surface temperature difference from observations between uh, two decades straddling the year 2000. You can see this negative phase of the PDO. And in this case, you can clearly see uh, the uh, AMO signal, um, even though there is a lag between the two indices. So, 
correlations, uh, teleconnections, sorry, between uh, the two basins can give rise to uh, um, equatorial Pacific sea surface temperature anomalies. And this is a pacemaker experiment by Kuchaski et al. Um, in which you can see that if you forced the Atlantic with prescribed, um, well, if you prescribed sea surface temperature in the Atlantic, in this case with a negative AMO signal, then you can force a positive sea surface temperature anomaly in the Pacific. Okay? So part of those uh, sea surface temperature anomalies in the Pacific might also be driven by teleconnections uh, from the Atlantic. So here I, I will try to put together two hypotheses that have been uh, going around for a few years, which are the uh, atmospheric bridges that we've been listening to already, but also the oceanic tunnels. So also the ocean dynamics plays a major role in, uh, in um, tropical and extratropical uh, interactions, or at least we think they do. And um, the upper circulation, so the thermocline circulation, gives uh, roughly the uh, time scale of these uh, circulations, which is on the order of a decade. Okay. So the, the main hypothesis is that if there is a tropical forcing pattern that can force extratropical uh, flow response, like in generating part of the uh, PDO index, then perhaps those atmospheric uh, uh, signals in the extratropics can also force a response that can feed back to the tropical Pacific. And so the, uh, how the uh, ocean does this is mainly through the subtropical cells. These are observations from Zhang and McFadden in 2006 in which uh, they are showing a quarter-work convergence of the subtropical cells, so the effect of both subtropical cells converging uh, mass flux at the equator. And here the uh, time series is reversed to show the uh, highly anti-correlation with uh, equatorial sea surface temperature anomalies. Okay, so this is um, data. And here you can clearly see a low frequency signal in the subtropical cells and the high correlation with the uh, sea surface temperature anomalies in the equator. So we're going to be using a model, and it's not going to be a couple model. It's going to be an atmospheric model, firstly uh, forced by sea surface temperature, and then we're going to use a, uh, an ocean model driven by those atmospheric uh, anomalies. So the model is pretty coarse, but it's a global, region, uh, global uh, ocean model to degree of resolution. Uh, we have a control run, which is forced with uh, an atmospheric state, which is called the CORE, Coordinated Ocean Ice uh, Reference Experiment, which includes all sort of uh, data sets. And the atmospheric model is the speedy model, which is developed here by Franco Molteni and Franco Husky. So what we're going to do is, first we're going to run the atmospheric model uh, forced by uh, SSTs, observed SSTs. And we're going to run a 10-member ensemble of that. And the um, internal variant SST are only present in the Pacific. But in the uh, uh, other regions, Atlantic and Indian, we're going to be using a climatological. So we can be sure that the uh, uh, signal that we see is just produced by the interannual uh, varying SSDs in the Pacific. Then we're going to take that ensemble member and we're going to take all those um, uh, atmospheric fluxes and we're going to compute anomalies, the decadal anomalies, started in the year 2000. And we're going to feed those anomalies to our ocean model, which is forced by climatological fluxes, climatolog climatological uh, atmospheric state, plus the anomalies derived from the atmospheric simulation. So this is the anomalous forcing that we get uh, by forcing the uh, atmospheric model with uh, SSTs, observed SSTs. So you can see the, uh, temperature, sorry, the temperature up there, the sea level pressure signal, and the wind and wind curl. Okay? So you can see a familiar pattern here in the Pacific a uh, very strong asymmetric response uh, in terms of sea level pressure with the Luton law. And uh, the wind stress and wind stress curl in this case that we are forcing with a negative SST anomaly at the equator, the wind stress and wind stress curl are responding in an, in an opposite sense as the climatological uh, state. And that's going to be very important. So now you might wonder where is the uh, anomalies that we see in the exotropics coming from? Is it uh, coming from the tropics, or is it local air-sea interactions? So what we did is to force uh, the, uh, those 10-member uh, ensemble with um, only anomalies in the equatorial Pacific, so that we are sure that all the uh, forcing comes from the equatorial Pacific and not from the uh, local air-sea interactions. And this is the pattern that we get, which is very similar 
to the previous one. So most of the response in terms of wind and wind stress curl is really coming from the equatorial Pacific forcing. Okay, so we are gonna be running uh, the ocean model now with all those uh, anomalous fluxes. And so, as I said, we have a control run, which is a very long control run, uh, quite spun up. And then we have a few perturbation experiments in which I will add the uh, anomalous forcing to my uh, ocean model, okay? And there's a few of them. Uh, speedy all, I'm putting all the anomalous forcings into the ocean model and down to the uh, most simplified and the one where I get the uh, largest response, which is PDW, where I'm only using anomalous uh, forcing in the wind stress and wind stress curl. So this is the atmospheric response, which is what we expect. If we're forcing with a negative anomaly at the equator, then we get a weakening of the Hadley cell. This is the um, first top plot is the decade 2000-2009, and this is the atmospheric stream function for the uh, decade before. If you take the difference between the two, you see a weakening of the Hadley cell and also a shift towards the equator of the Hadley cell, which is constant with the thermally driven Hadley cell. If we look at the heat transport, here you see the climatological heat transport in the model, which is quite realistic. And here you see the uh, anomalous heat transport, again, taken as the difference between the 2000 decades and the 900, uh, 190 decades. And you see a negative um, anomaly in terms of heat transport in the northern hemisphere consistent with the weakening of the Hadley cell and the response from the SST forcing. So that's all very consistent with what we expect the atmosphere to respond to that forcing. Now we look at the ocean model and we force the ocean model with those uh, anomalous fluxes. And this is, uh, this is the first response that we get. We do an EOF of the um, uh, SST in the North Pacific, and we see something that might be similar uh, to a, a PDO-like pattern. This is a switch-on experiment. So what we see is, uh, is an adjustment to uh, the uh, forcing, the anomalous forcing that we are putting into the model, which is a, roughly a uh, decadal time scale adjusting to this anomalous forcing. So now we look deeper into the ocean to see what is happening into the ocean. Uh, yesterday we've seen a, a um, plot of the meridional overtonic circulation in uh, depth space. Now I'm showing the uh, meridional overtonic circulation in density space. So this is uh, potential density in the y-axis and this is latitude in the x-axis. So here you're supposed to see two subtropical cells around the equator. And this is the anomalies, again, uh, when you force the ocean model uh, with those anomalous fluxes uh, as compared to the control simulation. You see a uh, weakening of the subtropical cell in the uh, northern hemisphere and a reduction in the heat transport associated with that in the northern hemisphere as well. And the response that we get at the equator is because the subtropical cells are weakening, there's less heat transport uh, away from the equator, less upwelling at the equator, and so we get a positive SST anomaly um, at the equator which is actually uh, damping the original cooling that originated the whole thing. So again, you might think, um, what is the ocean really responding to? Is it responding to the anomalous winds at the equator, or is it responding to the anomalous winds that are north of the equator, subtropical and extratropical regions? So we did another set of experiments where we are forcing our ocean model only with anomalies north of 18 degrees, pole width of 18 degrees, or only within a band of 18 degrees at the equator, and see what is the response of the ocean in that case. Okay. So those two experiments are called speedy no trop, so wind anomalies only pole width of 18 degrees, or anomalies only within the equatorial band. And what we see if we force the ocean model only with the wind anomalies within the equatorial band is that we don't get that weakening of the tropical cells no weakening in heat transport, and the, not much of a signal in terms of SST at the equator. If instead we force only with the wind anomalies poleward of 18 degrees, so the extratropical wind anomalies uh, coming from the atmosphere, then we recover most of the signal in terms of weakening in the tropical cells, weakening in uh, oceanic heat transport, and that warming at the equator, which dumps the original uh, signal. And in order to see the time scale of this, you can look at the heat content anomaly uh, within a, a box in, in the equator, uh, which is given there in the top 500 meter. So if you do the uh, TROP experiment, so only forcing the ocean model with wind anomalies within the equator, then you don't have much of a signal. It's a, it's a fast response, 
and is actually uh, trying to reinforce the original anomaly. But if you force your ocean model with extratropical wind anomalies, then you get this um, um, increase in heat content because you get that warm anomalies at the equator, and actually uh, it uh, um, spins up on a decadal time scale. Okay, and it's quite uh, it's quite uh, stable as a solution. Yeah. So now we try to model uh, this already uh, simple um, framework with a with an even simpler. Um, model, kind of a toy model, and this is starting from the end, so the late oscillator of Swartz and, and Schoff. So we start with uh, three equations, one defining uh, the uh, evolution of the uh, temperature at the equator, one is going to be the jar index, and another one is going to be the cell, subtropical cell index. Okay. So the, um, the hypothesis here is that the um, uh, sea surface temperature uh, are forcing the jar index circulation, which uh, is then connected to the uh, subtropical cell index. Okay, there's a few parameters. This this is the the uh, well-known part from uh, Suarez and Schoff, and there's the um, um, the uh, JAR index. As I said, is connected to the temperature at the equator, and the uh, cell is going on the same sense as the JAR by definition in this case. So with the proper uh, tuning of parameters depending on, on the uh, trying to get a, uh, a correct response in terms also of the observations, then we get this, this kind of behavior in terms of uh, temperature at the equator, the gyre index, and the cell index. Okay? So this is quite a, a, um, a good representation of what ENSO is in reality. And you can see the uh, blue line is the low frequency uh, evolution of this uh, T anomaly, which shows some decadal anomalies. And there are, by construction, anti-correlation uh, subtropical cell index anomalies in this, in this uh, plot of the uh, uh, subtropical cell index. Okay? To test whether the uh, connection between the uh, temperature and the jar is really essential in order in this model to generate those uh, subtropical cells uh, low frequency anomalies and sea surface temperature anomalies, then we can play with this model and, for example, eliminate the connection between the uh, sea surface temperature at the equator and the jar. And so is this a tropical connection, tropical exotropical connection, really necessary to generate that uh, low frequency variability? And in this case, it is. If you take off that connection, then you basically don't generate any low frequency variability in the tropical cells and the uh, sea surface temperature at the equator. Okay? So at least in this model, the connection between the gyre and the equatorial temperature is essential in order to uh, spin up the tropical cells. So in order to uh, put together these two hypotheses, the atmospheric bridge and the oceanic tunnel, then we can have a look at the simple schematic in which you start with anomaly at the equator, which through an atmospheric bridge generates some atmospheric response in the exotropics. That atmospheric response is able to force the ocean, which responds by spinning up or down the subtropical cells, and then you get a reversal of the uh, original SST uh, anomaly in your, in your ocean. Okay? And this is, this is all based on previous theories in, in both the atmospheric bridge and the oceanic tunnel. So we're just putting two pieces together here. So is this, does this make any sense in a, in a more real model? And I think it does. Uh, so this here I get, uh, yeah. Um, in gray is observations. So gray is the uh, sea surface temperature evolution uh, over the past uh, 100 years. And the dotted lines, the gray dotted line is the observations of the surface, uh, the uh, subtropical cell index, okay, the one that I showed at the beginning. Uh, if we force a global, the same global ocean model with time varying uh, core two forcings, then we are able to reproduce the uh, subtropical cells variability in this model. Okay, so the, uh, the model is actually able to reproduce the subtropical cell variability during this period. So if we uh, remove the wind forcing within the equatorial band, if what I said up until now make any sense, then we are supposed to uh, maintain that low frequency variability in the subtropical cell. And we actually do. This is the same kind of experiment by just forcing the ocean model with time varying winds north of 10, 15 degrees, north and south of 10, 10, 10 15 degrees. And so we retain most of the subtropical cells variability and most of the uh, sea surface temperature variability in the ocean model. 
So do couple models, semi-fine models, are able to reproduce any of this uh, low frequency variability? And actually, they don't. So at the uh, top left, you see the uh, reanalysis data. The uh, black line is the uh, subtropical cell index. And the um, gray line is the uh, CCFS temperature. And all the other models basically are not reproducing any kind of low frequency variability during the historical records. So for some reason, subtropical cells in CIMI-5 historical models are not able to reproduce any low frequency variability as observed. So conclusions. Uh, the atmospheric response to tropical forcing does seem to have some feedback on the um, subtropical ocean, which in turn is forcing an equatorial time delayed response, at least in this simple framework. So we are basically putting together two, two things, the atmospheric beach and the oceanic tunnel here. So also subtropical force, subtropical cells variability, I think is a key player in generating this low frequency equatorial Pacific variability. And the subtropical cells are forced by subtropical winds, not equatorial winds. And this natural mode, which is just one of the possible low frequency, um, um, one of the possible mechanisms that generates low frequency variability, can perhaps be another one that explains the warming hiatus together with the local Pacific decadal variability and also the teleconnections. Thank you very much.